thank you, Pejman and uh, Dan, for the invitation and for this introduction. And uh, thanks to all of you for staying uh, to this late hour. And uh, we really are out of time, so I will stick with the theme of being out of time as I have no choice. Uh, I have no disclosures. This is what I wanted to tell you. We were going to talk about the dilemmas, the thyroid nodule dilemma, the thyroid cancer dilemma, discuss the types of well-differentiated thyroid cancer and the pathogenesis of thyroid cancer, talk about the diagnostic utility of molecular markers, primarily the gene expression classifier, as well as gene mutations and rearrangements um, that um, have uh, I've been making their way to the clinical arena, talk about prognostic utility, and close. So uh, quickly, the thyroid nodule dilemma. There are too many of them, as uh, shown in this slide from Dr. Mazzaferi from this paper in the early 90s and um, subsequently shown again in multiple studies, um, thyroid nodules are very common with approximately 50% um, of 50-year-olds having a thyroid nodule if we look by a sensitive mean such as an ultrasound. And oftentimes, the thyroid nodules can come like this as a multi -nod multiple nodules in a gland making it very difficult to decide which to, um, to go ahead and biopsy or what to do um, to distinguish which of these um, are benign, which are malignant, and what to do about them. And for the most part, 90 to 95% of the pool is benign. And so while a fine needle aspiration, sticking a needle in these nodules, and using our cytopathology colleagues to help us with the diagnosis is great, um, it's invasive. And ideally, we would want to have a non-invasive tool um, to try to help us with which of these nodules to put a needle in, um, and that would be great for both cost and patient comfort. And the ATA has, uh, in their upcoming guidelines, recommended patterns of thyroid ultrasound, which we should rely on to help us decide initially which lesions we should stick a needle in with high suspicious um, lesions being most likely to be biopsied and um, less suspicious lesions to be left alone and potentially monitored. But even after um, we take a nodule um, that looks suspicious such as this one with irregular borders and microcalcifications and hypoechogenicity and biopsy it compared to a nodule, a spongy form nodule such as this one that's thought to be benign and send the cytology off to our pathologist, cytopathologist, and come up um, with a diagnosis. We do pretty well, um, but nowhere near perfect. When um, the diagnosis is malignancy, um, we get it right a, um, a very, very high percentage of the time. This is one of multiple large um, series where um, patients who have received an FNA um, and then come to surgery for whatever reason, the um, FNA is compared to the surgical follow-up. And so when the call is a malignancy, we get it right um, very often. But there's this large group of indeterminate lesions where we're not sure this indeterminate category, which includes suspicious lesions, lesions suspicious for follicular neoplasm or consistent with follicular neoplasm, and atypical lesions um, where a large, uh, large majority of these patients go to surgery, but only a small minority or a fraction of them actually have malignancy. And also, we have unsatisfactory results, which require a biopsy, and even the benign um, is not 100% benign. So the question is, can we do better? And then we also have the thyroid cancer dilemma, the prognostic question. When we diagnose thyroid cancer, um, is it a bad cancer? Does everybody need surgery, radioactive iodine, and thyroid hormone suppression? Or can we do a better job of selecting um, the nodules and the cancers um, that are likely to go bad? By and large, we know that the majority, the, the prognosis for patients with thyroid cancer, by and large, is, is quite good. Um, and it's proven difficult to select um, who are going to be the bad players. So can we do better? Uh, in terms of the types of thyroid cancer, um, we have your classic papillary thyroid cancer and your follicular thyroid cancer shown here breaking through the capsule. 
where the um, cytopathologic architecture um, drives the diagnosis. And we know that um, both of these well-differentiated tumors um, can de-differentiate into more poorly differentiated and then transition even into anaplastic um, type of lesions. And in general, the pathogenesis of thyroid cancer is thought to include genetic um, factors as well as environmental factors um, which couple together to um, begin um, the, the process of neoplasia. And the genetic factors have been broken down into more initial um, initiating events and then later mutations which drive the um, poor differentiation and the aggressiveness of the tumors. And looking at it a little bit more schematically, we have a follicular cell um, which will undergo mutations, ones that are more associated with um, uh, development of a papillary thyroid cancer, as we'll talk in a moment, are your RET rearrangements and your BRAF mutation versus RAS mutations in the PPAR gamma rearrangement, which will drive the follicular cell more towards that of a follicular adenoma and carcinoma with secondary progressive factors being added um, that ultimately lead to um, further dedifferentiation and aggressiveness um, of the, the tumor. So um, when talking about well-differentiated thyroid cancer, uh, we have point mutations and gene rearrangements, the point mutations primarily of BRAF and RAS, and gene rearrangements um, that include the RET-PTC gene rearrangement and the pax 8 PPAR gamma. These mutations are thought to activate two intracellular signaling pathways that are very important, uh, and those include the MAP kinase and AKT pathway, and these mutations are thought to be mutually exclusive of each other. Looking at it schematically, we have a Gro a, a commonly a, gro a growth uh, receptor, a tyrosine kinase growth receptor on the surface of the cell uh, where mutations can occur either at the intracellular um, kinase domain of the receptor or in either of the um, mech erc or AKT pathways where you have these mutations that we just mentioned that lead to a turning on, a constitutive activation of the pathways um, that lead to cellular signaling, nuclear signaling, uh, which results um, in cell uh, proliferation that's uncontrolled. I will skip over the details other than to say um, that the BRAF mutation is the most common alteration in PTC and it's specific to PTC. And the other um, rearrangement, the RET-PTC that's associated with um, papillary thyroid cancer, um, there are multiple different subtypes. Um, type 1 and type 2 represent 90% of your RET-PTCs, um, and they're more commonly found in patients with radiation exposure and childhood PTC. For your follicular cancers, the mutations of RAS, which could be NK or HRAS, Again, we have constitutive activation of the pathway, um, and this is most commonly found in follicular but also papillary thyroid cancer um, and is commonly found in the follicular variant of PTC, but also in follicular adenomas. And the PAX8 PPAR gamma rearrangement uh, is a rearrangement that leads um, to cell transformation um, by an as yet unclear mechanism, um, but has been associated primarily with um, follicular thyroid cancer and follicular adenomas. Then we have our secondary uh, mutations that are common to multiple um, different tumor types, um, and they can include uh, mutations in your tumor suppressor genes, such as P10 and P53, or other genes that are important um, to cell um, differentiation and uh, replication, such as the um, beta-catenin in the WIN pathway uh, and PIK3CA in the um, AKT pathway. So what is the prevalence of these mutations in thyroid cancer? Well, that has been uh, a progressive um, a, a target, a moving target over the last 20 years. We started in the early 90s knowing uh, and being able to identify a mutation in only about 25% of patients uh, with thyroid cancer. Uh, 
and by 2000, we were up to 35%. When BRAF was discovered by 2005, we were up to 70%, and today in 2014, we can identify a mutation in over 90% of thyroid cancers. So then the question becomes, how can we use these markers um, to help us with the dilemmas that we mentioned earlier, the thyroid nodule dilemma, the thyroid cancer dilemma? And uh, while initially when testing uh, and evaluations occurred, um, all the diagnostic categories of FNA were being evaluated, the focus um, fell mostly ultimately on the indeterminate category that we mentioned earlier, where, um, which is utilized 15 to 30 percent of the time uh, with most patients sent to surgery, but the histologic malignancy rate um, could be as low as 10 percent. And so the first large um, study to, um, to look at this was the study by Yuri Nikiforov, where they took a large number of uh, indeterminate cytology samples, and they looked at the histology compared to the mutations. And looking at this seven mutation panel back then, and back then, by, back then we're talking about 2011, um, what they found was that if they took um, this initial um, diagnostic category in this, in this indeterminate category, either the atypical lesions, the follicular neoplastic uh, lesions, or the um, suspicious for malignancy. Um, when they looked at only pathology, their risk of malignancy uh, was as shown here, 14%, 27%, 54%. If they added this um, panel of testing, um, if you were positive for any one of these um, seven mutations, that increased um, your cancer risk to 88%, 87%, and 95%. Um, and therefore, um, was found to be complementary to FNA. So if you added the molecular testing to the FNA, um, there was a high specificity and positive predictive value, um, so you could be more sure about sending your patients to surgery. However, if the testing was negative, um, you still, um, in the AUS flus category, you got down to close to 5%, which is the gold standard low end of acceptability that's provided by a benign FNA. Um, but for these other categories, the risk was still quite high to make any recommendations other than maybe to go for a lobectomy as, as opposed to a total thyroidectomy. So complementary to FNA and a rule and test with a high positive predictive value um, and a high specificity. At the same time, um, a gene expression classifier was being developed where um, a, a group of approximately 150 genes and their expression was being analyzed and found to be um, predictive of predicting um, a benign lesion. And so, um, this classifier um, was uh, published in 2012 with a high negative predictive value on the order of 95 and 94 percent and a high sensitivity. So um, the way this was supposed to work out is that we would take this indeterminate category, perform the classifier, and if the classifier was negative, it would decrease the risk because of the 95% negative predictive value down to 5%, and you could comfortably watch these patients and not send them to surgery. If the classifier was suspicious, there was approximately a 40% risk of malignancy, um, but all these patients were going to surgery anyway. So this was found to also be complementary to FNA, and this was a rule-out test, a test um, with negative predictive value. And so um, algorithms began to be developed and published in the literature about taking this indeterminate um, group and performing either one or both of these tests um, in, in series. Uh, and that became quite complicated. You need a separate sample. Most of the time you can wash out the needle, but most of the time you need a separate sample um, from each of these. And, um, this group uh, is only diagnosed uh, a small percentage of the time, so you would have to save a sample, get your diagnosis, and then send the sample off. Um, and so in addition to it being complicated um, and difficult in practice to run both these tests at the same time, um, we also um, began to consider the 
um, importance of the prevalence of disease um, when trying to understand what these tests mean. And so the prevalence of disease in our population um, impacts the positive and negative predictive value. And why the Bethesda um, system for reporting cytopathology expects that in the AUS FLUS category, the malignancy rate will be 5 to 15 percent, and in the follicular neoplasm, 15 to 30 percent. When you look um, at studies such as this and different centers uh, that report their malignancy rates for the atypia and the follicular neoplasm categories, we see that there can be a great variability. Uh, with a 6% rate of malignancy, for example, at Northwestern compared to a 48% at Brigham and Women's. Same thing for your follicular neoplasm category. Very low rates of malignancy with very high rates of malignancy elsewhere. And so depending on the center and your cytopathologist and your rate of malignancy, the outcome of these tests, the negative and positive predictive value, will, can vary greatly. Um, and so it's very important to know what it is at your own center. And at our center, um, at Harbor, at Cedars, and at Ron Ronald Reagan Medical Center, the prevalence of malignancy in the AUS FLUS and the follicular neoplasm categories is about 30 to 35 percent. And so if you do the math at our centers, um, and you look at the GEC classifier, and you take the sensitivity and specificity of the test, and you do the math with a 35 percent prevalence of malignancy, the negative predictive value drops to 91 percent, so less than the 95% and less than that gold standard 5% cutoff that we're shooting for. So it's important to know that if at our centers you use this test, um, you're up to now 9, 10% of patients um, who you could be sending um, away with disease. So as all this was happening, next generation sequencing um, came around and it revolutionized our ability to se sequence genes going from um, uh, increasing logarithmically multiple logs, the number of bases that could be sequenced, um, and minimizing the cost from thousands of dollars to a few cents. And so in addition to uh, our understanding and discovery of new molecular markers, um, our ability to se sequence at a very uh, low cost multiple genes um, has now revolutionized the field over the last couple of years. Um, this was the, the first expanded panel from that 15 gene panel, from that seven gene panel that I mentioned earlier up to 15 genes that was published in 2013. And the anticipation was that the increased number of genes would now improve the sensitivity and the negative predictive value of the molecular testing. And we can see on the panel here um, multiple um, mutations being analyzed with most tumors having one mutation, but some tumors having uh, multiple mutations. And um, the idea again was that we could now, with the improved number of markers, further decrease this negative predictive value of this test down to 4% or below and meet that gold standard target of a benign FNA. And um, that uh, led this year to the um, publication of this Thyro Sequencing 2 panel, which includes 60 genes. Um, and there, there were two components to the study, a retrospective and a prospective group, which performed similarly in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and high negative and positive predictive values. And this is the overall test performance. And so now when you look at this expanded panel of 60 genes and you consider the cancer prevalence along with the positive and negative predictive value and you plug in the 35% malignancy rate at our centers, you come up with a positive predictive value of 88% and a negative predictive value of 95%. So one test that can provide both a rule in and a rule out are both good positive and negative predictive value. Um, in terms of prognosis of molecular markers, um, briefly say that uh, the presence of over one driver mutation uh, may lead to aggressiveness and that these um, markers here have been associated with aggressiveness of tumors, um, still very much in the early stages. Um, and the BRAF mutation may have some uh, prognostic uh, ability, but there's lots of controversy.
the ATA and their new proposed guidelines will be recommending, um, with some caveats, the uh, use of molecular testing. And to summarize and conclude, um, ultranography should be used to direct selection of thyroid nodules to be aspirated. Molecular markers appear to be complementary um, and they can improve the diagnostic accuracy of FNA, particularly in the indeterminate um, uh, cytology group. The gene expression classifier is highly sensitive and has a good negative predictive value, but we need to be aware of the prevalence of disease at our individual institutions to be able to interpret the test for our patients. The thyroid sequencing 2 panel is highly sensitive and specific with a high negative and positive predictive value. We again still need to be aware of the disease prevalence in our population, but it appears to now be a test that can um, provide both negative and positive predictive value. And the prognostic significance of molecular markers remains controversial. Thank you for your attention.